Welcome to Zooming In, a project of the Unpopulist. I'm Aaron Ross Powell. I'm joined today by my colleagues Sheikha Dalmia and Akiva Malamit for our Editor's Roundtable. Recent reporting has uncovered plans by Trump allies and Trumpist think tanks and other organizations to deconstruct the administrative state. I think all of us agree that the administrative state is unaccountable and too large. So what's wrong with Trump's plans to reform it? Good morning, uh, Aaron and uh, Akiva. We haven't done this in a while, right? So we are uh, getting together in this format after a long time. But uh, I'm surprised, Aaron, you didn't use the word deep state because that's the term of art these days, right? What's wrong with the deep state? And uh, there are actually plenty of things wrong with the deep state, but we actually in the U.S. don't really have a deep state. Deep state is an idea uh, that was originally meant to describe uh, the kind of uh, bureaucracy we had in countries like Turkey and Egypt, which was controlled by the military and security forces. And uh, they engaged in all kinds of machinations behind the scenes to control civilian authorities and uh, the populace at large. And uh, their functioning was completely opaque and the subject of all kinds of conspiracy theories in the Middle East. That's not what we have here in the United States. What we have in the United States is a problematic situation where you, you know, if those of us who believe in a government of limited size and scope, uh, the federal government is very large. It performs functions far beyond what you know, I think it's fair to say the founders originally envisualized. And the bureaucratic state, the administrative state has grown apace. Now, if you talk to my friend Frank Fukuyama, he will tell you that uh, actually the bureaucracy is not large enough because the federal government's functions have grown far, far more than the bureaucracy has. And the bureaucracy simply can't uh, keep up with providing the kinds of uh, professional and efficient um, execution that it was meant to do. Now, regardless of what you think about that view, I think uh, the if from our point of view, an administrative state uh, that uh, in its current form is quite problematic. But it is part of a bigger problem with the federal government. Um, as the federal government was originally visualized in this country, each branch had very specific role and had very specific powers and functions. And each side was supposed to guard that, guard their functions in a very, very jealous way. And the idea was that would allow the public at large to keep each government, each branch accountable. And uh, at the same time, it would provide, each branch would provide a check on the other. But in our scheme of things, each branch of government is supposed to jealously guard its powers uh, so that it can perform its functions and also allow uh, the public to hold it accountable. Now, that actually has not how things have worked out in the United States over a period of time. Congress has delegated too much of its authority to both the president and the executive agencies under the president. So if you think of the War Powers Act, uh, it was supposed to curtail the president's war making ability. But the but Congress has got used to giving very large, you know, authorities, authorization of power to wage all kinds of wars in all kinds of countries post 9-11. So that was one huge usurpation of power by the executive, not intentionally, uh, but in effect from Congress. Congress also writes very broad and vague legislations and then lets the administrative branch uh, define them in any way it wants to. That essentially means, this is a critique of the administrative state, is that therefore the administrative branches have very sweep sweeping legislative powers through their powers of interpretation that nobody can really control. Uh, Congress can't control the executive agencies and the president can't control the executive agencies either because many of these people are civil servants and bureaucrats and they are protected by rules of a professional uh, bureaucracy. So they, they become largely unaccountable. And if you are listening to our conservative friends, there's an additional problem, which is that 
the civil servants tend to be somewhat uh, leftist in their biases. So they have an ideological agenda uh, to promote uh, environmental legislation or, you know, equity legislation and what have you. And all that becomes a problem for them. Now, I would be in favor of uh, limiting the size and scope of the administrative branch if it was part of broader broader reform of government, where the Congress took back its legislative powers and um, and therefore the administrative branches had to do less in terms of interpretation and execution. And then you could shrink the size of the administrative state too. But uh, that's not what uh, Trump is proposing. What Trump and the Republicans are proposing is not, in my view, a deconstruction, which is a term of art, or uh, the rationalization of the, administra uh, of the administrative state. They want to uh, co-opt and take over the administrative state for their own ends. And their ends are essentially twofold. Their ends are to punish their enemies and reward their friends. Uh, that's what the right has been saying it wants to do for a very long time. In Trump's case, it means punishing enemies means not just ideological enemies, which is certainly a part of it, but actually his personal enemies who have tried to hold him accountable for things like calling a, a mob to ransack the Capitol. He wants to go after Biden and, uh, you know, Hunter Biden for purely political purposes. That's not really a reform of the administrative state. That's a co-optation of the administrative state. Now, how is he planning to do that? And there is actually like a three-part plan to do this. The first part is that all presidents get to appoint 4,000 political appointments across federal agencies. And that is not something that Trump alone can do. Every president does that. What is different in this case is that most presidents will look for people who have expert expertise and merit uh, have some kind of like a claim to merit to run the agencies or be part of the agencies that they are going to be placed in. That's not what they want to do. Heritage Foundation and America First Policy Institute and then Steve Miller's, I think it's America First Legal. They have a plan to install loyalists, Trump loyalists uh, in these positions. Um, that's a problem. And the second part that they want to do is there are 50,000 employees who are Schedule F employees, uh, and they are off limits to the political branches in a certain, in, in a certain sense. And Trump wants to uh, re-up his old executive order, which will essentially make them at-will employees and allow him to fire them. Uh, and again, if he was planning to do this, uh, in order to streamline and rationalize the administra administrative state, that would be one thing. That's not what it is. He wants to flatten the points of resistance that he encountered in his initial first term, uh, uh, you know, that prevented him from implementing unconstitutional plans, uh, many of which he still managed to do, for instance, on immigration and what have you. And that's what he's trying to do. And that's why it's all problematic from our point of view, even though we want a smaller administrative state, we want a well-defined government with specific roles. This is not what that is. I think those are excellent points, Shika. And I think uh, one of the things that's important to emphasize here is the idea that there is a distinction between harnessing government for your own ends and making government smaller in general. And that really the function of what Trump wants to do is to make government a tool of his own ends. And one of the things that I think is critical here is that he doesn't really have a plan for what he wants to do in society. What he does is he has certain temperaments about who he likes, who he doesn't like, um, who his friends are, who his enemies are, and then follows those as a kind of very disorganized set of policies to punish his friends and reward his enemies, and rather than enact any kind of comprehensive plan of reform. And in general, what he wants to do is change institutions wholesale so that they no longer serve the so-called liberal elites that he's so constantly in favor of attacking. Now, this resembles in many cases this, a similar kind of plan that uh, has been enacted in many European populist contexts in Hungary and Turkey and Poland and so on, 
where there's no real plan for what government should or shouldn't do. There's an idea that there are certain people in power who we don't like, certain outgroups, social outgroups, liberals, feminists, gay rights advocates, and so on. We want them out of power. And instead, we want to put in our own socially conservative, hardline, um, nationalist stormtroopers. And in essence, what we have is a cultural fight over which culture sh uh, should the institutions of government be wielded. Should they be wielded in favor of a kind of progressive, quote unquote, woke agenda, or they should be they wield in favor of a socially conservative, regressive, reactionary agenda? And of course, independently of whether you're on one side or another, the real there's there's one question which neither side is asked, which is, should the institutions of government be wielded for these purposes at all? And so it's clear that what Trump is doing is simply agreeing with the progressives that the institutions of government should be wielded to order to force people into certain modes of action and modes of being, but he wants to do it on behalf of his own conservative reactionary forces rather than progressive ones. That seems like that describes Trump, who is just pure id without much in the way of ideological grounding or even kind of conceptual coherence. He just urges and a sense that there are people who are obsequious to him and he likes those people and people who aren't and he doesn't like those people. Does that describe the broader plan here? So when the Heritage Foundation is putting out its 900-page proposal for policies, their project 2025, I think it's called, um, or when they're vetting people to take over all of these roles in the administrative state that Trump will make vac vacant through these various machinations, it feels like those sorts of organizations and people like Stephen Miller do have a more coherent view of what they want society to look like, why they are doing this. They're using Trump as the way to gain power. And then these mechanisms are a way to further assert power because Trump has a certain sort of popularity with a distressingly large portion of the population and we can leverage that. But this feels much more calculated than what you're describing, Akiva. And I agree like the the Viktor Orban analogies, I think, hold that there is this sense that we just – what we want is what we, meaning the, the people advancing these plans, not me, um, want is a society that holds to a certain set of conservative views and values and uses the oppressive power of the state to stamp out feminism and LGBT identities and – wokeism, whatever they happen to mean by that, um, and doesn't make white people uncomfortable by teaching the history of racism and so on. But it doesn't feel like just kind of we want to change the culture of the institutions. It feels much more like there is a specific end goal of remaking society to look like a certain thing in mind. I think that's exactly right. In Trump's first term, there was a disconnect, right? The existing conservative establishment had, you know, which was sort of reflected the Reagan era consensus of a certain kind of fealty to limited government, you know, principles, at least in, uh, you know, uh, pr pr offered lip service to those principles um, and also wanted a certain limitations uh, on the power of the state. So they may have had a cultural agenda, just at the left had a cultural agenda, but they had a higher, um, you know, loyalty to these other sort of other principles. And they felt that if Trump came along, they could use the Federalist Society to put such jurists in courts and, you know, who were not primarily, who were originalists, limited government types, textualists and what have you, first and culture warriors second. Trump came along on a populist agenda. I mean, his was a populist mandate. He came, he got elected as a culture warrior. Now, you know, one can debate whether Trump is truly a culture warrior or not. It doesn't matter. But he got elected on a culture warrior agenda. That was combined with a certain taste for power in him. 
But to the extent that the the courts, the bureaucratic branches, the Republican Party was populated with these other kinds of conservatives, there was a mismatch in what he wanted and his mandate and what they wanted and their longstanding, you know, loyalties and commitments. That has all shifted now. Now there is a harmony in the mandate that Trump wants to get elected on and what the right-wing establishment wants to do. And that's where the heritage foundations of the world come in. I mean, heritage now looks very different. I mean, heritage was never kind of to my taste, but the heritage of today is very different from the heritage of pre-Trump. Now in it, it's in it for the power. The whole idea of a limited government, because you know you worry about what your opponents are going to do when they come to power, is gone by the win- is gone through the window. They want to amass as much power to uh, cram as much of their culture war agenda as they possibly can. And Trump, they see, will play ball on that. There will be no tension between that agenda and what Trump wants to accomplish. Trump's added need is for loyalty. Trump's added need is for personal power, which they are just happy to go along with, because in this case, his power will in in fact serve their ideological goals. It seems like we are seeing then, in the way that you describe it, something of a broader version of a longtime hobby horse of mine that I've written about, which is... We, especially in the United States, tend to treat the right and conservatism as synonyms. They're, they both just mean the same thing. And so if you're on the right, you're a conservative. If you're a conservative, you're on the right, and their political projects are identical. And it feels like what's happening now and what was recognized in the first Trump administration with the kinds of people – they appointed a lot of conservatives – to positions of power. and But what they didn't get from that was a sufficient quantity of people who were the necessary degree of being on the right to do the things that they wanted, that these people had conservative commitments to institutions and principles and so on that got in the way of a far-right agenda. And so a second Trump term and and this split in, in the Heritage Foundation, the Heritage Foundation used to be a conservative organization. Now it is a far-right organization that is not conservative, um, that, that there is this real decoupling and that the right is, is arguably the most radical political contingent in the United States right now has abandoned conservatism and and doesn't hold at all to a desire to maintain governing institutions but instead in ties back to what the right has traditionally meant is simply a political movement for exercising heavy power in the service of creating or or reestablishing certain hierarchies that they see as having eroded under liberalism. Yeah, I think that's right. I think um, what's happened is we've had a destruction of the idea of conservatism, not just in the sense of small government, but in the sense of conserving institutions, in the sense of there being checks and balances and power and balance to power and preserving a certain liberal legacy of America's founding documents and a shift towards trying to exercise power for its own sake and to exercising power on behalf of certain culturally conservative um, ends. And so we have a shift from conservatism in the sense of conservation or conservatism in the sense of liberal government to conservatism as revolutionary. Um, and this is something that Tom Palmer talks about in an unpublished paper that he delivered to the Mont Pelerin Society uh, about the idea of a conservative revolutionary. And this is something that the conservative revolutionary in the original sense were actually the predecessors to the Nazi regime um, in Germany. And these were people who saw the whole business of democratic politics, of the give and take of democratic politics as impeding their ability to enact their will on the populace and to impose their social conservative agenda and to revive the cult of the nation and so on. And so describe themselves very much as conservative, but not in the sense of you know everlasting principles and certain code of ethics and so on, but conservative in the sense of being right-wing and right-wing in the sense of being nationalist, being socially conservative and so on. And we see this repeat itself in the Trump administration to a greater extent, and um, which is trying to follow in the lead of contemporary populists like Viktor Orban, like the former prime minister of Poland, 
like uh, Georgia Maloney in Italy and so on, and who see their their role as agents of the right and the right being defined in a revolutionary way to transform society into their own ad, into an organ of their own making, an organ that is suffused and uh, constructed to favor certain social classes and hierarchies, to defend traditional gender roles, to defend the traditional family unit, um, to be anti-LGBT, and so on. Right. Yeah, I think, yeah, Tom Palmer's piece on the conservative revolution was actually sort of eye-opening because it was so historical, right? And if you don't like the so-called liberal radicals, wait till you, till you get the conservative radicals uh, who, uh, you know, who get their uh, hands on the levers of the state, right? I mean, it is pretty terrifying what they would want to do. I mean, if you look at some of like the blueprints of what the Heritage Foundation and Steve Miller have in mind, it's downright chilling. I mean, Steve Miller is immigration agenda, and he has said that. Uh, I mean, he's openly mocking uh, immigration advocates right now and saying, wait till we come, wait till our second term, you won't know what's hit you. And the kinds of things he wants to do, not only will, you know, there be detention, not only would he re-up everything he did in his first term. He has plans to build all kinds of huge detention camps to throw immigrants, undocumented immigrants and anybody else coming into the country. Uh, there will be deportation raids galore. Uh, but beyond that, plans to take away, deport people who are openly pro-Palestinian or anti-Israel. Uh, at least this is Steve Miller's agenda. There will be litmus tests on the immigrants who are coming in, into the country to make sure they actually, you know, tow a sort of like a right wing line. Now, this kind of uh, meddling, it, trying to socially engineer a public to serve the state ends of a, of the right, is kind of like you know, it's kind of scary and. Not where we, not where this country has gone before, as best as I know, uh, even under the worst of circumstances. So yes, yeah, so sort of the the idea is to have some kind of a conservative revolution in which you use the levers of the state to cram as much of the conservative social agenda as possible, and then to hell with the you know the the next the the democratic government once it comes into power. And uh, my fear is not just that, you know, what conservatives are doing will end with conservatives, but then it will be picked up by progressives in future administrations to push their own, you know, draconian ends. So it's a downward spiral. So we have a situation where you have a a past president who hopes to be a future president who wants to come in and re-engineer the state essentially to be what Polemicus thought of as justice, which, as we've mentioned, is punishing your enemies and rewarding your friends, um, married to these conservative intellectuals who want to take those urges and use them in the service of re-engineering society towards far-right ends. But a lot of this is being spoken about is to go back to our, our opening remarks, a lot of this is being spoken about in in the language of reforming the federal bureaucracy, shrinking the administrative state, making it accountable, making career bureaucrats easier to fire so that we can get turnover and we can get accountability. Like all of these are things that classical liberals have talked about for decades, right? Like these are, we've all, we need to reform the administrative state. We need to figure out how to make it more accountable. We need to shrink it. We need to return lawmaking power to Congress or demand that Congress retake lawmaking power instead of writing this legislation that's like, this bill will tasks the EPA with making the environment better and then lets the EPA fill in all the details of what making the environment better means and so on. Like, all of that sounds very classical liberal, but is now being co-opted for decidedly anti-liberal, if not you know outright authoritarian ends. What do we do about that? Because what I don't think we want to do is become cheerleaders for the administrative state in the way that when in the early Trump administration and throughout the Trump administration, you suddenly saw 
progressives embracing the FBI as this force for preserving and protecting democracy and our freedoms. And Shika, when you were saying at the beginning that you didn't think there ever was a deep state in the U.S., the one counterexample I could think of is like J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. It was about as close to what you were describing as, as I think, like as far as big institutions go. We don't want to just become Pollyannish about the administrative state because all of those classical liberal critiques still hold, right? So what do we what do we do about this current situation? How do we fight back against misuse of administrative state reform without kind of giving up on the real need to reform this for liberal ends? You know, one of the uh, things that the Trump era did was to make me reevaluate my positions about the administrative state. Uh, you know, I, I think I've mentioned to you guys, I grew up in an India of the License Raj and uh, the Yes Minister BBC series, where uh, you know, the license Raj was this hidebound bureaucracy, which, uh, you know, controlled uh, the lives of citizens because it had these powers to extract rents in the form of bribes for them for everything that is that an ordinary citizen wanted to do. So you want to build a house? Well, you're not going to get uh, clearance from the bureaucrats till you give them a hefty bribe. And, uh, you know, this was uh, there was so much corruption in India due to the administrative state that the reform of the administrative state, uh, you know, was something that appeals to me inherently. But the one thing that the administrative state in the U.S. has done well, and I, I take your example of J. Edgar uh, Hoover, Aaron, completely. I mean, not just that, you know, he was going after Martin Luther King. They were going after Martin Luther King, the FBI was, and, uh, uh, you know, infiltrating civil rights groups and, uh, uh, you know, in for the worst possible ends. But that said, by and large, the administrative state has done a pretty good job of uh, keeping public corruption at bay in this country. American bureaucracy and American government is, at least at the federal re level, is really not all that corrupt. And I can't over overstate, you know, just how much stability and trust that builds in institutions when you have institutions that at least don't have this one big vice, which is corruption. Um, and in the Trump era, I mean, the, the administrative state performed quite well, I think. Uh, it, uh, uh, you know, it provided advice to him and provided resistance to his worst possible designs. I mean, things on immigration would have been a whole lot worse if there hadn't been bureaucrats within the Department of Homeland Security telling Trump, no, you can't throw uh, you know, people into concentration camps, essentially, right? And you can't simply go around uh, taking funds from the military and putting them for the uh, towards the wall, although Trump tried to do it via an executive order. So, you know, there were, I mean, the one role that the administrative, and this is where I kind of agree with Frank Fukuyama, is there is a need to defend certain amount of independence of the administrative state so that it can provide a check on the nefarious designs of uh, government officials who wield a whole lot of power and ensure that they are wielding this power in a responsible and a non-corrupt way. And so how do we get uh you know some give some autonomy to the administrative state to provide this check on public corruption while at the same time not becoming monstrous and a uh, bane on the public itself is a difficult question but what you you do what you don't do you you don't do is flatten this these points of internal resistance so that a exec a populist demagogue can simply come in and do exactly what he what he pleases, regardless of whether it fits in with the broader constitutional design or not. I don't know. That doesn't answer your question, but I think you know the the issue is to get the incentives right within the administrative state, rather than to simply uh, throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think one of the things that classical liberals often overlook is that they may not want much of a state. 
but those parts of a state that they do want to function have to function well. So even if you wanted a really small state, a night watchman state even, um, you need the courts to be not corrupt. You need the bureaucracy to be non-corrupt, to be accountable to people. And one form of accountability is avoiding awarding political office on the basis of patronage, on the basis of nepotism, on the basis of special connections, um, because of bribes and so on. And you want uh, a culture of meritocracy to exist so that you have uh, a set of people in these agencies who are loyal to the agency and to upholding the rule of law and to upholding uh, norms of impartiality rather than to worrying about whether they're friends with their boss or whether their their boss is friends with the president and so on. And so you want to avoid these kinds of norms of corruption that are so common in so many parts of the world um, in which the deep state is really unaccountable and in which you really don't have uh, the kinds of checks and balances between the legislature, the executive, um, and the administrative state that you do in the United States. Thank you for listening to Zooming In at the Unpopulist. If you enjoy this show, please take a moment to review us in Apple Podcasts, and also check out Reimagining Liberty, our sister podcast, The Unpopulist, where I explore the emancipatory and cosmopolitan case for radical social, political, and economic freedom. Zooming In is a project of The Unpopulist. <laughs>